What does it mean to be wise? How can a person find or how can a person learn wisdom or receive wisdom? And why would we call a person a wise person? These are some of the things that we're going to consider this morning with the passage that we'll be looking at. So this week, we've been the last few weeks in the book of Psalms, but this morning we're going to be moving from the book of Psalms and into another of the poetic books, the book of Proverbs. So before we dive right into the book of Proverbs, as we did with the book of Psalms, let's consider some of the background of this book, some of the background of the book of Proverbs. If you look right at the beginning in the first chapter, you see the main author of the book is stated in the first verse, that it is Solomon, the, the son of King David, who also would become uh, King Solomon. And there are also some sections throughout the book that, are, that do come from other authors, but the main author throughout the book is King Solomon. And as it says in 1 Kings 4, if you may or may not know things about Solomon and who he was, his wisdom, which was given by God, it said that his wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the East, so all the people of that area of the world, and that people from all over the world traveled to hear of his wisdom. Queens, kings, people from all over the world traveled to hear his wisdom, what he had to share. And that is what this text is ultimately about. The book of Proverbs is ultimately about wisdom. As its goal is stated in the first seven verses, which is to describe and to instill wisdom in God's people, that it would be a wisdom that is founded in the fear of the Lord. And other wisdom books that you can see in the Old Testament include the book of Job that we looked at briefly, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Song of Solomon, and also some of the Psalms, including one of the ones that we looked at. So the theme verse of the book of Proverbs can be seen in chapter 1, verse 7, which says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, that fools despise wisdom and instruction. And the fear of the Lord is mentioned many times throughout the book of Proverbs. And almost always when the fear of the Lord is spoken of, it's almost always connected with wisdom or with knowledge. So it's saying that to be wise is connected with having a healthy fear of the Lord. So cons- we need to consider what does it mean to fear the Lord? This is something that we have spoken on before in different ways at different times. But preparing for the sermon, I found an interesting article regarding this on the Back to the Bible website written by Dr. John Newfeld. He says, What is something that someone can do to bring great glory to God? He says, to behold all that God is and to understand all that he's done and then feel the weight. Again, he said, to behold all that God is and understand all that he has done and then feel of the weight of that. And then he continues to say, I guarantee that when anyone genuinely attempts this of God, great fear will come upon them. Suddenly, God won't feel so small anymore. He won't feel so insignificant. God will rightfully be recognized in our minds and in our hearts as our superior. So as we think of the fear of the Lord, we can think of these words. And as we look into the book of Proverbs, as we open into it this morning, we must remember this, that the fear of the Lord being as the main theme of this book. But let's read together. We're actually going to be reading from Proverbs chapter 3. Verses 1 to 7. So let's read together as we get into this passage this morning. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 to 7 says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of day and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So as we move into this passage, as we shift from the book of Psalms into the book of Proverbs, again, we should remember the theme verse that I mentioned from chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or knowledge. 
that we would behold all that God is and understand all that he has done, as Dr. John Neufeld said. And over the last several weeks, we've been talking about this in different ways, that we have considered in our praise and in our worship of the Lord, that we would consider both who he is as God and all that that means, and also all the things that he has done, all the things that he is doing, and all the things that he will do, that we can worship him for that. So as we look at these seven verses that we just read this morning, we will first look at verses 1 to 4 to consider the context of this passage, but really want to focus in on verses 5 to 7. And the heading of this passage, at least in my Bible, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And of course, this comes from the key verse that is seen in in verse 5. And you can see that these verses are phrased as a father speaking to his son, starting in verse 1 where the son is told to not forget the teaching, to not forget the commandments that he has learned from his father. And it sounds similar to to Psalm chapter 1, which we looked at a few weeks ago, where it's said to delight in the law of the Lord, to delight in his commandments, to meditate on his law and his commandments day and night. And it's clear that as you take this passage as a whole, these seven verses that we're looking at, that this father, who is Solomon, the author, was offering advice to his son, and he was doing it out of the wisdom that had been given to him by God, as mentioned before, that he was the wisest of all the men in the East and that people would travel from far, vast distances to hear of the wisdom and the things that he had to share. But he knew that for his son to have a successful, to have a fruitful life, he would need to follow God, to trust in the Lord, and to look to him in all ways as we will see later in the passage as we get into it. And the picture I get as uh, Solomon is speaking here reminds me of what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, where he says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And this is the picture that we see of the author here, of the King Solomon, who is speaking. Not that he has lived some perfect life to emulate, but that in his wisdom, this God-given wisdom that the thing of most importance that he learned in his life was to follow God. And if you are familiar with the life of Solomon, as you may have read about him in the the Word, that he did eventually kind of go off track. He let some of his foreign wives, his concubines, distract him from his purpose of following God. And perhaps him speaking now to his son is out of that looking back with regret on the things that he did or did not do and the way that he had strayed. But And speaking of this, or maybe he spoke these words before he had let himself be led astray. We don't know for sure. But he is speaking these words out of the wisdom that was given to him by God. Speaking these words to his son, speaking these words to us that we can also receive. And thinking on the way that Solomon is sharing with his son, sharing this wisdom of his son with his son, it makes me think of the things that my own dad taught me, the things that my own dad shared with me, the advice he gave me in all areas of life, as Solomon does throughout the book of Proverbs. But more than just the things I heard my own dad say to me, the advice that he gave to me, a lot of the things that I remember from his life that I try to put in practice were from his actions, the things that I saw him do each and every day. Seeing him spend time in the Bible every day, every morning. Seeing him serve in the church in many different areas, whatever was needed at that time. And also in seeing him love and care for my mom each and every day. I learned so much from those things as well. Not just the things that he said, but the things that he did. Especially now that I look back and think upon those things. So as Solomon shares these words with his son here, he encourages his son to follow the example that was laid out before him. And he is given a promise. Actually, in these first four verses, verses 1 to 4, Uh, Solomon gives his son several commands, so things to do, and then several promises that he will receive if he does obey the words that are given to him. So he is told these commandments. He says, if he will not forget his teaching, if he will keep these commandments, and if he will live with steadfast love and faithfulness, it says that he will receive a long life, he will receive peace, he will receive favor, and he will receive good success, good success both from God and from man. 
You may be familiar with this formula. You see it in many places in the Bible where a command is given and then a promise comes along with it. In many of the times where God gives a command to people or a person, he gives a promise along with it. A lot of the covenants that he gives, he gives a command and a promise that comes along with it if they are faithful. Basically, the general formula, if you are faithful, if you are obedient to what I tell you to do, then it will go well with you. But this is not to say that we do these things, that we obey these commandments simply to receive the blessing or simply to receive material things. For we follow God because we love Him. God is our Father and we desire that relationship with Him. And thinking about this, I thought of the thing that people often say that they would, the thing that they would not want to hear from their parents, which is, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. Just disappointed in what happened. And Maybe that is true a lot of the time. We would rather someone be upset with us than be disappointed in them. Maybe you've lived your whole life not wanting to disappoint people in your life, whether it's your parents, your friends, or whoever it is. So in the same way, we would not want to disappoint our Lord. We would not want to disappoint Him in our relationship with Him, but we want to build that healthy relationship. We want to spend that time with Him. We want to learn from Him. We want to listen to Him. We want to do what the Lord asks of us because we love Him, because we respect Him, and because we have that healthy fear of Him that we mentioned before. So that's briefly just kind of going over the first four verses, but we come to the section I really want to focus on, verses 5 to 7, where we hear more ways that we are called to live our lives. Again, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In the first four verses, we have seen the different advice being given by a father to a son, and we see this continue here. Again, there's both the positive side what he is to do, the things that he is to do, and the negative side, what he's told not to do. Again, there's the trust in the Lord and do not lean on your own understanding. It shows that it's really an all or nothing thing here. That not we would just trust the Lord when times are difficult. Not that we would just be able to figure things out by ourselves most of the time, but then trust in the Lord only when you really need him but that we would trust in the Lord with all our hearts, our whole being, looking to Him, trusting in Him at all times, not relying on ourselves, not relying on our own intellect, not relying on our own understanding, the own things that we have learned, but to trust in Him, to trust in Him for everything. And do we live like this? Or what would it look like to live like this? To trust in the Lord with all your heart at all times in everything. I'm sure that there are ways that we do trust in the Lord. That there are areas of our lives where we trust and There's times when we trust Him for everything. But to trust Him fully with all our heart, all the time, certainly is something to work on. Certainly something to strive towards. To live our lives not focused on all that we can do, not all the things that we can do by our own strength, but rather relying on God, trusting in Him for everything, trusting that He is in control of your life, trusting that He has your best interest in mind in your life, trusting that God knows the plan for your life, that He knows the plans He has for you. So the question is, will you seek his plans? Will you trust in him? Will you seek his purpose for your life and not your own? And as we touched on before, Proverbs has a lot to say about wisdom. And it's important to realize, again, as I mentioned, this wisdom was given to Solomon by God. This is not the wisdom of the world, the wisdom that the world seeks after that comes from studying for many years from getting a master's degree, from getting a doctorate, having the letters after your name, having an extensive library, but wisdom that comes from God, the wisdom that comes from the fear of the Lord. As is seen, as I mentioned with Solomon, as is seen with Solomon, King Solomon, this wisdom that he had came from God. It was a gift for a humble man who did not seek fame, He did not seek riches from the Lord when he offered him all anything that he wanted, but he asked for the wisdom and the knowledge that comes from God. So the question for us as we consider Solomon and his words and his life is, do we we seek God's wisdom? Do we seek his wisdom as Solomon did? 
Or do we rather rely on the wisdom that this world has to offer or the wisdom that this world seeks after? So that's verse 5. Continuing on into verse 6 where it says, In all your ways, in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. So again, we see this other command. In all your ways acknowledge Him. But again, it comes with the promise. If you acknowledge Him in all your ways, He will make straight your paths. He will show you the way to go. He will guide you in all that you do. So again, we see this all or nothing statement here as we saw in verse 5. It's not when things are good, acknowledge God. Thank God when you have good things happening to you. Or it's not only just when times are tough, look to God. Acknowledge Him when you're struggling. But in all your ways, at all times, acknowledge Him. We are called to acknowledge Him in all things, in all areas of life, at all times. Do we do this? That's the question again for us this morning. Is God a part of every aspect of our lives? Do we acknowledge His involvement in every area of our life? Do we thank Him each day for every blessing that we receive from Him? And do we acknowledge His presence in the difficult times? Do we acknowledge His presence in the deep darkness? Do we look to Him? Do we trust Him? Do we truly trust Him? Do we truly believe that God cares for us? Do we truly believe that God has our best interest in mind day by day, moment by moment? Do we trust that He has our best interest in mind? Do we trust that God has a perfect plan for our life? More than we could ever plan, more than the things that maybe we want or what we desire. Do we trust that God has that perfect plan for us? And not only do we trust in the things that God has for us, do we trust in God that He is who He says He is? Do we trust that God is love? as He says He is? Do we trust that God is good? That God is good all the time? Do we trust in that? Do we believe that God is above all things? That He is the all-knowing, all-seeing? That He is unchangeable, immutable? That He is the perfect God that we worship? Do we believe these things? Do we trust in these things moment by moment, day by day? As I was writing this sermon, right at this moment, I heard a song by Jeremy Camp playing. If you're not familiar with Jeremy Camp or who he is or his story, uh, he's a Christian artist, a musician. Um, If you're not familiar with the story of his life, he was married young, but very shortly after he was married, his wife got very sick and eventually died. Well, not even eventually, but very shortly after that, she died. She passed away. But even in that dark, even in that difficult time, Eventually, he was able to return to music and eventually write the song, uh, I Still Believe, even with all that he had dealt with. And there's a movie based on his life with that title. I would recommend it if you haven't seen it. But thinking of him, thinking of his life as I heard his music, uh, even in that desperate, even that difficult time in his life, he was still able to trust in God. He was still able to acknowledge God and praise Him even with all that he had lost. And even out of that difficult time of loss, he knew that God still had a plan for him, that God still had a purpose for his life, even if it had been hard to see in those dark moments. So thinking of our life, I'm sure that we have all been in that place, in that dark place where it seems uncertain what God is doing or what God will do out of that moment. Or if you haven't been in that place, I'm sure you will be one day. Where it seems impossible to see how God could bring you out of that dark, desperate place that you're in. And how God could ever use that difficult time, that desperate time for His plan. How could He ever use that as a part of His plan for your life? But the truth is that He will. As I said, He has a perfect plan for each and every one of our lives. This is why we are called to trust in Him. To trust in Him with all our hearts. To acknowledge Him in all our ways day by day. So that in those difficult times, in those desperate times, it will be easier to turn, to look and rely on Him. Because it's something that we're doing moment by moment. And it will be easier in those good times to not forget about God, but to turn to Him, to thank Him. And day by day to simply trust Him in everything. To seek Him in everything that we do. As it says... He will make straight your paths as you acknowledge Him in all your ways. And then finally we see verse 7 where it says, Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. 
So again, we see what was said in verse 5 being said in another way, where first it said, do not lean on your own understanding. Now we see him say, be not wise in your own eyes. In both of these verses, Solomon is essentially saying not to rely on your own knowledge, do not rely on your own wisdom, the own things that you have learned, and do not desire what the world considers to be wisdom. Let's quickly turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 18 to 19, which talks about the wisdom of the world. It says, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 18 and on. Says, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you, anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. The wisdom of the world is folly with God. The wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. That is what it says. So do not be wise in your own eyes because the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. And then it continues on. It says, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So again, we see this central topic that was introduced in chapter 1, that theme verse of the whole book, where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Continued here, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn from evil. So as we read in the beginning from Dr. Neufeld, if we recognize who God is, if we recognize what God has done, what He is doing, what God will do in the future, if we put Him in His rightful place as Lord, we should have this healthy fear, this reverence of God, that He would not be small, that He would not be minuscule in our lives, but that He would be put in His rightful place. So only when God is put in His rightful place of Lord and Savior of our lives, that He would be put in His rightful place as both Lord and Savior of our lives, will we have His wisdom and will we understand His direction for our lives as we have that healthy fear of the Lord in our lives. So as we leave from here this morning, as we move out from this passage and into our everyday life, the questions we have to consider, will you trust the Lord with all your heart? Will you trust Him with all your heart, with all that you are? Secondly, will you acknowledge Him in all aspects of your life? Not just in those aspects where it's easy, not just in those ways that life is going good, but even in the difficult areas of life. Will you acknowledge Him in your life every day, each day, moment by moment? And thirdly, will you put Him first? Will you put God first? Turning away from the wisdom of the world, the things that are offered by the world that are considered wise and desirable, and turning from those things and putting the Lord first instead of what we see from the world around us. So will you trust the Lord with all your heart? Will you acknowledge Him in every aspect of your life day by day? And will you put Him first, spurning the things that the world desires and looking to Him first? So these are the questions we face as we consider this passage this morning, as we've looked at it this morning. The questions that we face as we go from here today, as we live our lives, as we move on day by day. Where will you place your trust? Where will you place your trust? That's the question I leave with you this morning. Let's pray together. Lord God, we just thank you so much for who you are. Again, Lord, we thank you for your word, the blessing that it is to look into your word, to see the ways that we can learn from you, that we can draw near to you, Lord, that we can be encouraged by you and who you are, Lord God. Your word is so amazing, and we thank you for it this morning. And we pray that we would take these words seriously, Lord, that we would trust in you with all our lives, Lord, that you, we would acknowledge you in each area of our life, day by day, moment by moment, Lord God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please.